to Good Morning Relentless Church. Can you do me a favor and stand up? Everybody stand up. Look around, masks on, masks on, masks off. Look at somebody and just tell them, I'm really glad to be worshiping Jesus with you. I'm really glad. Find a couple people, just tell them. To our Rock family, God bless you today. So grateful that you are here. Let's stay standing for a second. I feel the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit, and I don't believe we need to leave this moment. I think we need to just offer a praise to God. We should just lift up a, a, a wave, perhaps an applause, just a, just a sweet, we don't have to yell or shout. Today's worship has been so refreshing. I think that's the right word. Is there anybody else that senses what I sense? God is, it's almost like the waves of the ocean. If you've ever been to the ocean, you put your feet in the water and then you see the waves coming and you try to back up, but the waves still catch you. I just need you to know that the wave of God is getting ready to catch you and it's, it's going to be a warm embrace. It's something that you need. I sense that God is doing something refreshing in people's lives today and online are our rock family, I'm telling you, in your home. I'm going to tell you something before I preach that I believe is very important for you to know. I was in prayer uh, early Friday morning. I could not sleep all night from about 4 to 6 a.m. I was just praying. And the most unbelievable thing happened. I'm telling you the God's truth. When I first got filled with the Holy Spirit at 19 years old, at 1047 Dana Avenue. I remember the electricity that shot through my body in that moment. And the same visitation that I had at 19 met me in my bedroom this past Friday. And I believe it was because the enemy was trying to take me out. I was, I was in the ER till six in the morning uh, yesterday, right? I was in there all night. The devil was literally after me. And I said, he is so angry that we are taking territory. They did all these tests on my heart. They were like, is it a heart attack? Is it da -da -da -da? Were, they couldn't find anything. I said, it's an attack. Some stuff is natural. Other things are spiritual. And I just want to let God know, I thank you, God, that you have chosen Relentless to take territory. And devil, you have no authority and you can't stop what God is doing. And I just need a few people that will lift up Jesus and understand that we are in supernatural times and it requires supernatural power and that the Spirit of God is not a game, he is not a joke, but he is real and he is active and God is alive. I wish I had some help. I don't need spectators today. Oh, glory God. I told the Lord, nothing will stop me from bringing the word this morning. I've got a word from God to bless the people of God. Is anybody ready for the word? I need a couple of people to pray in the spirit and just saturate the atmosphere. Father, we bless you. I, I, I just need the leaders to intercede and to pray because we are being invited to a place of relevance in culture that has rarely been given to the church. We are going to take that mantle and we are going to honor God. I've got two amens and some people that may not understand what I'm saying. Bless your heart. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. To all of our first, second, or third time visitors, my name is John Gray. I'm the pastor of Relentless Church, and I want to welcome you into the presence of the Lord. However you found yourself here by invitation or accidental, you have an appointment with the Lord today. And I am grateful for those who are watching online, and we are grateful. And on behalf of myself, my wife, my kids, and every leader here, we want to welcome you this morning. 
If you will go with me to 3 John chapter 1. 3 John chapter 1. 3 John chapter 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. 3 John chapter 1. It says this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. There is a direct connection between the health of your body and the prosperity of your soul. And oftentimes when there is a dysfunction in your body, it is sometimes indicative of something that is deficient in your soul. Your soul is the seat of your mind, your will, your emotions. Those are elementary things, but I want to inform you, and I need you to prepare, and I need you to lean in, and I need you to wake up, and I don't need anybody around you sleepy because this is a defining moment in the development of who we are as a church. Now, join me quickly, Hebrews chapter 6, and then after this, you can sit down. Hebrews chapter 6, starting at the first Verse, it says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, Pastor DeMarcus, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, or the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Freeze. The writer is saying, listen, let's get past all of the elementary stuff. We've been here for too long. We've been here for years. You know about repentance from dead works. You know about baptism. You know about resurrection from the dead. You know about eternal life. And, and there's more than that to the walk with Jesus. Tell somebody there's more to it. I need you to find somebody else who is as excited about the word as you are. And I need you to tell them again, look at them and say, hey, there's more to it. And if by chance you're surrounded by someone you don't know, I need the church to turn around and look. And if somebody is there that you haven't met, introduce yourself and say, hey, my name is blah, blah, blah. And I want you to know there's more to it. Turn around, say hi. Angie's, it's people behind you. There's more to it. I need somebody to get this in your spirit. Caleb, there is more to it. And if the body of Christ would ever wake up beyond the elementary teachings, we could begin to see a revival in the land, and that's what we need. We don't need another Sunday service that turns into nothing. I don't want another empty calorie church sandwich. I need a meal that fills me on the inside and equips me to live a life of power and authority when I leave this building. I want more, and there is more. Will somebody give God a praise if you believe in more? We are still in the subject, a man, a mouse, and a ministry. And today's subheading is character development. Character development. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, and I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would make these words precise, that they would ignite the fire within, and that the seed of the word would produce fruit, and not just seasonal fruit, but fruit that remains. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated. Once again, I'm grateful that you are here, and I'm grateful that God has allowed us to spend this time together. I want you to know that your church is not waiting on culture to tell us what we should and should not do. We are going to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a real and meaningful way. As Pastor Joel alluded, God is doing miracles in the middle of summer. No one launches a church in summer. No one launches a church in another city. No one, no one does that, but we do. We always are going to do what God tells us to do. This is not about expansion. It's about obedience. And if God tells you to do it, you need to do it. Tell somebody, if God told you, you need to go do that. If, if he told you, just, just do it. It's so important. Um, but, but what I realize is that the church, today's version of the church, does not have a good name in the community in certain areas because we have lost the efficacy of the word and the personality of the Savior that we say we serve. And I want you to know that your church is 
uh, not waiting on what is popular or what is uh, well, well established. We're, we're, we're moving beyond the norms. Uh, I want you to know that in, in our Atlanta family, in our Greenville family, there was not, uh, there was recently someone in Atlanta, she was walking her dog in her neighborhood at, at one in the morning and she lost her life. Someone took her life in a horrific and violent way and she left behind a uh, fiance and she left behind family and this, this woman, uh, they still can't find it or they don't know anything, they can't find anybody and I was impressed by God's spirit to reach out. And long story short, I want you to know that our church is going to be covering the expenses for this woman's service. And the reason why I bring that up is because there are, there are communities of people that have been marginalized by the church where the church needs to make inroads and show that the love of God is available to all. This woman's future wife was has lost you know, this person, and where the church runs to judgment and condemnation, there needs to be an extension of an olive branch where people say, you belong before you believe. It is not popular, but it is the way Jesus handled people when he lived in the earth. That's why religious people didn't like Jesus, because he spent time with Lepers, wine bibbers, tax collectors, sinners, Zacchaeus is in the tree, Nicodemus is at night, prostitutes at the Pharisee's house, Syrophoenician women, women at the well. And so if you really want to know who Jesus is, look at who he hung with and look how they changed, but he didn't. Now I need 150 people here and 3,000 of you online to give God a praise break if you know that the church needs to get out of its judgmental zone and start loving people. Boy, it's real quiet in here, but I'm going to preach it anyhow. Somebody say character development. Walt Disney created Mickey Mouse in 1908. Mickey Mouse, 1908. A mouse that turned into a nation. It turned into an economy. It turned into a world that now encompasses Marvel and ESPN, and it owns ABC. A mouse owns ABC. A mouse owns ESPN. A mouse owns the entire Star Wars franchise. Not just the ones that we know, but those in perpetuity. A mouse. It started with a mouse. It started with a man and a pen and a mouse, and it developed over time. And it didn't just end with Mickey Mouse because also in 1908, Minnie Mouse came. You can't have Mickey without Minnie. It's not good that Mouse should be alone. Oh, I'll make a helper suitable for Mickey. <laughs> I'm preaching. Trying to help somebody up in here, up in here. Mickey and Minnie are great, Pastor Robert, but you can't create an entire ecosystem out of Mickey and Minnie, you're going to need a Pluto. You're going to need a Donald Duck. But what's Donald without Daisy? Y'all said Daffy. Daffy is another world. <laughs> Daffy is Warner Brothers world. That's, that's Bugs Bunny. That's, <laughs> that's Daffy. That's uh, Donald. Who else? That's the Looney Tunes. And isn't it funny? And, and here's what's deep. They have their own world. They're not in competition. They got Space Jam. They got the Animaniacs. Then, and if you don't like those, there's another mouse, Tom and Jerry, which, by the way, I love. Something about Tom and Jerry, but I didn't realize how violent they were till recently. Like, they are killing each other. But let's talk about the, the development of the, the Walt Disney world because at first it was just Walt Disney's idea, but the idea became a world, and it started with a sketch. And I love that Walt Disney's story looks like the creation story because you and I started with a sketch. After the world had been created, the, the canvas of the earth had been created with the mouth of God, he then confers with himself. 
And he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have dominion. Image, likeness, dominion. Image is a snapshot. Likeness is the substance. Image is the function. I'm teaching and you didn't write it down, so I'm going to repeat it one more again. Image is the picture. Likeness is the substance. Dominion is the function. He caught a snapshot, sketched it in dust. He formed it. Then he blew himself, breathed himself into it, gave us life, the ruach, the zoe, the God life. Then he says, now run the earth. I need somebody to put it in the chat for you. Run it. Oh, this is for anybody. That, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? Run it. Stop living with the me mealy mouth faith and afraid. Start moving in the direction of dominion. Run it. Walk this thing out. You have authority. Run it. And so God created man in his image and in his likeness, and he began to develop this world. It was Adam, it was Eve, and then they had children, and so on and so forth. And they, he said, fill the earth and subdue it. And so that was the function and the purpose and the initiation of God. How does this translate to this idea of a man, a mouse, and a ministry? When you look at this, this man who created an entire ecosystem around a character, a mouse, and then he added characters. And then years later, here comes uh, all the other uh, cartoons. You got Donald Duck showed up in 1934, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in 37. Daisy Duck didn't show up till 1940. Then comes Pinocchio, also in 1940. In 41 comes Dumbo. Scrooge McDuck came in 1947. Cinderella didn't show up till 1950. Alice in Wonderland in, in 1951. Peter Pan in 53. The Lady and the Tramp in 55. Sleeping Beauty in 59. 101 Dalmatians in 1961. Winnie the Pooh in 1966. I was in my my son's room two days ago and he's watching 101 Dalmatians with his sister like it's brand new. When you have a vision that outlasts you, then you have an idea that God gave you. I'm going somewhere. Oh my goodness, I feel the Lord. Somebody say character development. Now, let's get into the word. I just wanted to lay this foundation but Jesus is also extremely interested in character development. Everybody say character development. Jesus is extremely interested in who you become. Yes, he is. And how Jesus develops character is very different from how the world identifies what is popular or what is cool. Somebody say character development. So character development, by definition, for the purpose of this message, is the opportunity to go from elementary salvation to discipleship. Thank you for the one amen. I'll, I'll tell you why I say that. Character development, for those who are taking notes, is the opportunity to go from elementary salvation to discipleship. What does it mean? Jesus didn't call followers. He called disciples. Now, Jesus called disciples, and then he walked with them for a little over three years to prepare them for a mission that did not include his physical presence. Now, this is very important for the body of Christ because some of you are going to need to grow up. We've been holding on to the elementary things, but you're not in, you're not in your, your, your baby shoes anymore. You're not on milk anymore. It's time to eat meat. You're not using, take the training wheels off. It's time for you to begin to move at the speed of your purpose. The development of your character is directly connected to the calling that's on your life. Jesus was God the entirety of his existence in the earth, but he was not released to produce fruit that we are aware of until he was 30 years into his process. So for every one year of visible relevance, there was 10 years of silent development. 
he literally had to tithe. Off of his development. And you're angry and frustrated because you're not developing, but you're somewhere 30 years old. And you don't know that it took this long just for God to get three years of relevance out of you. I'm trying, something just broke in here. Stop being frustrated with the development of your character because God's not trying to make you popular. He's trying to make you holy. They're not going to clap, Pastor Joel, but I'm going to preach it anyway. And, and, and I feel something that, that, that needs to break. Character development is the opportunity to go from the elementary things of the kingdom into the deeper places. Anybody want to go deeper? Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Jesus called the disciples, and they followed him. But here's what's really deep, Elder Lori. You don't follow somebody you don't know. You don't walk up to the mall and be like, follow me. Nobody's coming. Because I don't know if you're crazy. I don't know anything about you. Do you know who he called? He called people who had been observing him over time. They were in the same proximity. You, he didn't just show up and then start talking. They had, they had interacted. That's how, that's how they said, listen, we found the Lord. We found the Christ. Because they had been observing. They weren't sure. They saw his character. They saw his development. They saw how we, he was progressing. But until he invited them. So when he invites them, they come immediately. They leave their boat. They leave their practice. They leave tax collecting. They leave. They, they, they roll with him immediately because there had been an observance that there was something on his life that was different than other people. What they did not know is that him saying, come follow me, was an invitation to what we now know is discipleship. But what is discipleship? Discipleship is the invitation to walk with Jesus, not just for the sake of public appearance. We got too many public Christians. But discipleship is the invitation to walk with Jesus so you end up talking like Jesus, so that you walk in authority like Jesus, so you can exercise power like Jesus, so you can walk in humility like Jesus, so you can produce fruit like Jesus, and not just seasonal fruit, but fruit that remains. True discipleship means you look more like Jesus each day because you're walking with him and you're talking with him, you're communing with him. And the more you walk with Jesus, the kinder you are to people. And the more you walk with Jesus, the less judgmental you are of people. And the more you walk with Jesus, the less you gossip. And the more you walk with Jesus, the kinder you are. And I'm very, 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 very nervous about people who say that they're an apostle or a prophet, but they don't have a heart of kindness or any humility. Because every time I see somebody who's encountered God in the Bible, they say, woe unto me. I'm a man of unclean lips, for I've seen the Lord. I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. Nobody's helping me. Then keep preaching, John. Don't wait for your help. Even Manoah, who was the father of Samson, when the, when the angel of the Lord came to him and his wife, and he says, why would you ask my name, seeing that my name is wonderful? And, and the spirit of the living God took off in the flames, and they said, oh, my God, we have seen the Lord, and we are not dead. There was a reverence for the presence of God, and we have lost the reverence for God. We have lost the reverence in the church. We have lost the sanctity of the church, and the church looks so much like the world because we want the validation of the world. And that's why we're not peculiar. We're supposed to be a peculiar people, a holy nation, his own special people. But we don't want to be peculiar. We don't want to be holy. We don't want to be special. We want to be accepted. I could use some help, Pastor Anzio. The day that the church needed to be accepted was the day we lost our anointing. Because if you need the validation of the people you're called to reach, then you miss the fact that you were called in the first place. I needed just a few more people to help me in here. 
Because we have, we have too many people that want the acceptance of the world. And the church has, call, has been called to be the uncomfortable conscience of the world. But now we don't want to talk about the things of the word. And the church is supposed to maintain its moral high ground. We need to be able to say, that's God. That's the devil. That's sin. That's right. That's wrong. Don't do that. Do this. This is the word of God. This is the synagogue of Satan. This, repent, turn from your wicked ways. And this is what the church has been called to. But character development is the only way you will have the boldness that you'll have the boldness to be who God intends for us to be. But the truth is, there's a difference between discipleship and fellowship. There were a lot of people that were following. He always had a crowd. But there are some that are content to be in the crowd from a distance. You can observe Jesus and not know Jesus. Discipleship is the invitation to come closer, to know him in an intimate way. Tell somebody, come closer. True discipleship means that I want the character of Jesus and not just the perfume of his presence. I don't want to spray on Jesus. I want to be immersed in Jesus. I want to be baptized. Is there anybody that wants to be fully baptized Listen, I, the Holy Ghost is on me. I just need somebody to pray me through. I'm, I'm so close to the breakthrough. And this is, this, is, this is Jesus developing disciples. And Jesus develops disciples in, in a number of ways. We know that he talked to the crowd, but then he would teach the disciples after the crowd left. And then he would also have one-on-one -on -one conversations, outer court, inner court, Holy of Holies. And so there's the crowd. Sunday morning is the crowd. Wednesday Bible study, that's the inner court. Prayer time by yourself with God, that's the Holy of Holies. See, this first Wednesday, Pastor DeMarcus is going to be bringing that word. It's going to be unbelievable. We're going to be in the house on this Wednesday, this Wednesday, this Wednesday. And we don't, we're going to be here to not only get the word, but be connected to one another. This is our community. It's how we grow. But the truth is, there are, there are some people who are content to stay at a distance. And I no longer want to be at a distance. There are people that are enamored by the personality of Jesus, but are offended by the person of Jesus. There are people who admire Jesus from a distance, but have no interest in getting to know him on a personal level. There are people who will receive miracles from his hand without hearing the words from his heart. That's how there were people in the crowd who he healed who were screaming, crucify him. Because you can get something from him and not know him. You go to restaurants all the time. You get food. You don't know them people. You know the brand. Too many people have assumed that brand Jesus is Jesus. But brand Jesus is not Jesus because you can't package him and make him uh, uh, the same thing for everybody. That's the power of discipleship because when Jesus was developing the character of the disciples, there were some things that were for the crowd, some things that were for the core, and some things that were for the individual. And what he spoke to Thomas, he didn't speak to Peter. And what he spoke to Peter, he didn't speak to James. And what he spoke to James, he didn't speak to John and what he spoke to John he didn't speak to Bartholomew and what he spoke to Bartholomew he wouldn't speak to the others do you understand what I'm saying when you really are hungering for for true discipleship Jesus takes a personal investment in you where it's not general it's great to know scripture generally but I need to know how it applies to me specifically is there somebody that wants a discipleship relationship with Jesus Jesus developed his disciples. And this to me is the power of God. Have you ever seen somebody that 
that you know walked with God? You, have you ever seen somebody say, they're anointed? We use that word too loosely. But there are some people that are anointed. I'm anointed. I don't play games. I'm anointed. You should know that you're anointed too. I, that, that wasn't me saying that in pride. I stand only because I've been anointed. But let me tell you something about the anointing. Because notice what Jesus said. I'm not doing ministry until I've been anointed. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon, is upon me because he has anointed me. See, the anointing is nice, but the anointee is better. I study for this one, Pastor Joe. See, there are people who scream they're anointed, but you're anointed by who? What anointed you? There is anointing. Some of it is God. Some of it is not God. But when you have been smeared by God, you walk into places without permission. Permission. Talk to me, Elijah. He went up to the king and said, won't be no rain around here for three and a half years unless it's by my word. It didn't say that he was invited, didn't say he sent a letter, didn't say that he knocked. He just showed up. I need you to know that just like that spider that shows up in the corner, just like that palmetto bug that showed up over there, you're going to get in rooms that you were not invited in and people are not going to know how you arrived, but it's because God has placed you in the room for such a time as this. And I need about 17 people to hear me that God has anointed you, therefore you don't need permission because he's going to personally open the door. Now I need a praise break in this place. That's a nice applause. I said somebody give God a praise break. Somebody shout character development. We need leaders who have been developed by the character of Jesus. But when you have been anointed by God, you only have as much authority as the one who anointed you. If you've been anointed by man, then that's the level of authority you have. But when you've been anointed by God, you can speak to the clouds and rain will show up. You can look at a storm and say, that's enough out of you. When you have been anointed by God, when you've been walking with Jesus, you can do what he did. You can say what he said. You can walk how he walked. I can walk on water, Peter. My shadow will heal somebody. Do you understand that if you walk with him, you carry his person with you? The church has been too content to stay on the outskirts and the suburbs of relationship without getting into the inner city of his heart. And we often use the excuse, she ain't nothing but a man. She's nothing but a woman. Be careful when you try to separate the man from the mantle. You'll miss God. Be careful when you try to separate the woman from the mantle you'll miss God. Don't use the humanity of an individual as an excuse not to listen to God. Mm-hmm. He fake. I knew he was fake because look what he going through. Do you understand that duality is not the presence of hypocrisy? Duality is the tension between humanity and divinity. You tripping because you found out something about her or something about him. Same stuff you doing. And now you want to invalidate their whole life. Like God was shocked when he anointed them knowing who they were. And so if God knew who she was and he still anointed her, why do you have a problem with it? If God anointed him knowing what he would do, why do you have a problem with it? Don't get mad because of God's choice. Find out why you want to invalidate somebody from being used by God because of their humanity. None of us are God. We're being used by God. We are anointed of God. We are not God. And that's the difference between a man and a mantle. That's why when Elijah went up to heaven, the mantle stayed here because the mantle is for the earth. I think I have some help in here. 
Somebody say character development. God is interested in the eternal state of your soul. Is there anybody in here that you were serving God, producing fruit, then all of a sudden something happened and it looked like you got knocked off your feet? All of a sudden it looked like God disciplined you? It wasn't the devil, it was God cut you off. Why did you cut that, God? Why did you take that away? You ain't read my word. What do you mean? Well, those who produce fruit, I prune them. Elder Lori, I need a few people to shout. I, I prune them. Why? So that they can produce more fruit. Well, I don't understand. I'm moving at a speed of light. I'm moving fast. I'm producing fruit. Yes, but your trunk is not solid. You're, you're young in the faith. You're young in your walk, and you're producing fruit. And if you keep producing at this level without a strong rooting system and a strong foundation, you're going to bend over and break. So I've got to cut some things off until your trunk can catch up with your limbs. I wish I had some help in here. Don't get mad when God cut off some of the branches. He's more concerned with your trunk than your limbs. We got too many people that want to have limbs. You want to sing a song. You want to preach a sermon. You want to be famous. But God says, I want you to be relevant. I want you to be humble. I want you to be faithful. I want you to be consistent. And that takes time. Oh, I feel the presence of God in this place. Oh, my goodness. God wants a return to discipleship because the emotion of the church Sunday experience has not really changed anybody. They sang all your favorite songs for years. Did it change you? You done shout it till you sweated out your perm. Did it change you? I've yelled at the top of my lungs. Did it change you? It's the still small voice that gets your attention. And I realize all the emotion in the world doesn't change the posture of a soul. Only the presence of the Holy Spirit in a true discipleship relationship will produce the fruit in your life that causes people to say that is a person that's been with Jesus. There are people who are content to stay on the outside. They'll come to church every week. They will never change because they have no intention of changing. Then there are others who come for the social experiment of being in the presence of new people. They have no intention of changing. There are people who pick up a microphone and they talk about Jesus, but really what they want is for you to worship them and desire them. And they don't want you to really look at Jesus. They want you to look at them. And the more you look at them, the, oh, Lord, help me. And it is in the nature of human beings to elevate and worship things and worship people. Why do you think we call them stars and superstars and, and, and idols, American Idol? I'll leave it alone. Michael Jackson was living. People would faint when he would show up. He'd stand in the grates and he had a, the wind blowing and the lights. He's like, ah! Like, oh, that's awesome. He's just a man. You fainted because of the illusion of who you thought he was. But then real power shows up in the presence of Jesus, a humble carpenter's son, walking everywhere, no horse, no car sitting on 24s, no armor bearers, no secret service, no security with earpieces, just walking around, talking to 25,000 people at a time, feeding them with some fish and some loaves. Nobody around. They were trying to kill him. He'd walk right through the crowd. You can't stop me. It's not my time. You can do what you want. It's not my time. You can say what you want. It's not my time. You can lie on me all you want, but the truth will outlive a lie. It's not my time. I don't know who this is for, but it's not your time. You will not die. You will not end. You will not bow. This is not your moment. In fact, this is a moment of great development, discipline, and resurrection for you. This is the 
Savior that we serve. I wish somebody would understand what's happening in this moment. This is a moment of character development. The silence that you sense is not God saying it's over. This is the development of character, and he doesn't develop character in public places. He develops character in silence and in dark rooms and in broken situations. He develops character. Why? Because when he develops you in that place, you can be trusted in the public space. We have lived too long in the shadows. He said, let us... The book of Hebrews says, let, let, let's leave the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let's go on to perfection. Let's, let's grow up. Tell somebody, grow up. We're not going to talk about laying on of hands and the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God and the doctrine of baptism. We know all that, laying on of hands and resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. Look, y'all past that. He's expecting that those who have been walking with Jesus would have some fruit past your elementary phase. And this is an admonition to everyone listening and the person that's preaching. Do not be content with an external experience. There's a lot of church attendees and very few disciples. You know why? Because discipleship is invasive. That means he has to get in your mouth, in your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone answers, I'll come in and dine with them. But the truth is, we don't mind Jesus on our porch. But when he comes in your house, what are you going to do then? Can Jesus stay in your spare bedroom? Can Jesus watch your Netflix account? Can Jesus check your browser history? Can Jesus scroll through your text messages? Can Jesus scroll through your mind? There's a whole lot of people wearing church clothes and they got a pornographic mind. Don't you ever think that because people shout here don't mean they got something else going on somewhere else. Somebody say character development. God is interested in the development of our character because our character is what is going to outlast us. I know this firsthand. I've had no interest at times in being developed by God because I would rather hold on to my pain. I'd rather hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness. And for the people that hurt me, I want them to pay. Anybody other than me ever felt that way? Somebody hurt me. I want them to pay. And it's, if, it, it is real. But the truth is, what about the people I offended who want me to pay? What about the people you did wrong that want you to pay? So be careful, because if God answers your prayers, he might have to answer some. That's why I said you better forgive people. You better do it, because if you don't, your sin's going to be held on to you. You don't want it. You better let it go. This is a great word from God. I feel like I, there's a couple more things. I just, I just got to get it out. Is it okay if I get it out? Because when God develops your character, he's doing it so that he can trust you with more. Somebody say, there is more. There are a lot of people who, who want the, the, the position and the title. But God is not just interested in the ones who got the title. There were 12 that were called disciples. But in the book of Acts, we find out that one of them got replaced. I'm looking at a church full of replacements. Yeah. Pastor Anzio, I'm on one today, man. Y'all didn't hear what I said. See, hey, I'm, I'm Peter, I'm James, I'm John, I'm Bartholomew, I'm Matthew, I'm Matthias. Hey, hey, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a disciple. But what you didn't see is that there was another crowd that was just as hungry and nobody knew their names. But everywhere Jesus was, they were there. They didn't get chosen the first time, but it didn't stop them from following him anyway. And there are people who stop following when your name is not called. 
and God says, in this season, I'm elevating the people who were faithful and they were invisible. Can you be faithful with no name? Because eventually, somebody's going to need you. Because what you don't know is one of the disciples is a Judas. And he was in the same opportunity as the other 11, but he chose not to receive the discipline and the correction and the adjustment and the invitation of Jesus, so he had to be replaced. Don't you think because somebody has a position now that God has not already chosen their replacement? You can be up one day and replace the next. Talk to me. Talk to me, David. Saul, I have rejected him. Samuel, go to Bethlehem. I have provided a king for myself. I need you to know God's about to show up in your neighborhood. He's going to go past all the people you think are more worthy than you, and he's going to knock on the door of your life. There was a man, there was uh, Matthias, and there was another uh, disciple, help me Jesus. There were two that had seen Jesus do work. They said from the very beginning, it's in Acts 1, the very beginning of Jesus' baptism by John all the way through his resurrection. And they said, we need to choose one of them who has been with us the whole time. This is really deep. You didn't know his name until the book of Acts. Ah, and here's what's crazy. He's the first New Testament disciple. We read about the disciples in the New Testament, but the New Testament didn't happen until he died. I'm trying to help you with your theology. He was an Old Testament Jesus that presented the new covenant in his blood. And so we find Matthias being the replacement for Judas. It was two of them, but the lot fell on Matthias. What am I saying? God is about to choose you, and he's going to choose you. Where was that at? Uh, uh, Acts 1, 23. And what was the name of the other disciple? Justice. Justice and Matthias. And then the disciple said, Lord, you know all the hearts of all men, so you choose which one will continue in this work. The Bible says the lot fell to Matthias. It's a lot that's about to fall on you. No, they, they, they didn't catch it. It's a double entendre. There's a lot that's about to fall on you. There's a lot. That means the choice of God. Then there's a lot. That's the abundance of God. It's about to fall on you. The next time somebody asks you, what's God doing? Just say, a lot. I need somebody to take off running, shout, stand up. The sermon is over, but I need somebody to... What's God been up to? A lot. What's Relentless about to do? How much money you got in your account? How much favors on your life? How blessed are you? I need somebody who has a lot going on to give God... A, a lot of praise. <laughs> it will all be worth it. You're getting ready to get a lot for your pain, a lot for your trouble, a lot for your tears, a lot for the loss, a lot for the misunderstanding. You're about to step into a lot. Holy Ghost. Oh, my God, and it is the first day of the eighth month. Did you hear what I said? I said it's a new beginning. Double portion on you and your house. 
double portion. And the fifth child is a grace child. And the grace of God be upon you in your house in the name of Jesus. Double portion. Seven figure anointing. Come on your house in the name of Jesus. And the legacy of the Stevenson family is secure in this seed. In the name of Jesus. Walk in the blessing and favor of God. It is so. A lot on you and Kelly. A lot. Double lot. A lot. A lot is a home. The home that you've been praying for, supernaturally yours. A lot. Territory in a new land. A lot. A lot. More than enough. So you can pray in the middle of the night, every three hours, the way God commands. A lot. And to move in the prophetic without apology. A lot. Where you can bring people to your house and pray over them. They get healed on the spot. A lot. It shall be as I say. And God is going to do it suddenly. Somebody say a lot. It's breaking in your favor right now. Somebody say a lot. Stay right there. Don't leave it. You went through a lot. So you get. If you've only gone through a little, this shout is not for you. But if you've been through a lot, if you've been through hell, if you've been misunderstood, if you've cried at night, if no one seems to understand, this message is for you. There's a lot going on today. If you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus. I don't know what you're giving, man of God, but it's coming back to you a thousandfold, a thousandfold, a thousandfold, a thousandfold, a thousand and a thousand and a thousand while you walk. It's abundance on your shoulders. You shouldn't even be here. The enemy tried for years to take you out and he failed. That's why you're here and you are seen by God and you are called by God and you are anointed by God and you are chosen by God and you're the one that your family has been waiting on and it's on your shoulders and it's in your mouth and it's in your hands and every tear you've ever cried that nobody saw, God caught it and it was a prayer and those prayers are being answered today. Today is when the lot falls on you. He chose you. It's your day. It's your time. It's your moment. I'm speaking to you right now. Woman of God, you're in your house right now crying, saying, God, if he's talking to me, tell him to point to me. I'm pointing to you. With your hands like this, tears falling out of your face, get up off that couch because God has decided to visit your home. It's you. The lot has fallen on you. If you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus or you want to be a member of Relentless Church, come to this altar right now. Don't wait. If that's you, if it's you online, text that number. I, somebody, needs to, somebody needs to give their life to Jesus. Somebody needs to join today. Oh, y'all got to do better than that. We got a new family. Who else? There she is. You sewing? <laughs> what you don't know is coming back 10,000 times to you. 10,000 times. Did you hear what I said? 10,000 times. <laughs> Somebody, what's, what's 10,000 times 100? No, it's not. 10,000 times 100 is a million. It is a million. You know, set up and sold and <laughs> Lord just blessed you with seven figure increase. Who else? I'm not interested in 
the games of church. I want power. I've cried too much. I've been through too much. I want to see God. I need you to know that this whole little corridor right here has so much power. And it's time for the third row to be unlocked. That, that needs to be the name of the collective, third row. It's, it's about getting people from the outer court into the inner court, taking them from the third row to the platform because you all represent a harvest of people that are coming into this ministry that didn't know that they were needed and welcome. And God is also breaking the divide between black and white. And you all are a bridge that allows people to know that no matter who you are, what you look like, or where you come from, you are welcome in our church. The third row is the oil because three is the number of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I need you to understand that there is something happening today, a significant shift in the Spirit. Is there anybody else, perhaps online? You need to text the number on the screen. Text it right now. Don't wait. Text it right now. Don't wait. Text it right now. Don't wait. Thank you, Jesus. I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. The blood is enough to save me from my sins. Forgive me, Lord, for the things I've done wrong. And today, I give you my life in a new way, in a fresh way. All the glory goes to you. Holy Spirit, come live inside and teach me how to be more like Jesus each and every day. You are my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe if you prayed that prayer for the first time, you're saved. If you were already saved, you're restored. And if you want to be a member of our church, welcome home. Which way are we walking, Pastor Robert? I need you to see the man in the light blue shirt. I want you to follow him. Now listen, we're getting ready to shout for you as you walk because that's what we do for new family members. Come on, shout for him. has met with us this day. Let us leave the elementary things of Jesus and go on to discipleship, character development. Give the Holy Spirit permission to get into the areas of your life that would keep you from producing fruit long term. That goes for me, it goes for you, for everyone who calls Relentless Home. If you will stand with me, I'm going to pray a prayer of benediction over you. For our visitors, thank you for coming. I hope that you felt welcomed. We would certainly love to have you back. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord God be gracious to you, show you his favor, and give you his peace. God bless you. Maybe you wave at somebody, shake their hands as you leave and tell them God's about to do a lot for you this week.